Good morning. It's my pleasure uh, to be the moderator of this session on power in the digital revolution, which is an incredibly uh, relevant uh, for the issue of uh, rebuilding trust, but especially in the light of COVID pandemic, which has been a catalyst for the digital revolution, taking a great leap forward over the last few months, um, but also has, I think, underscored issues that have been with us for decades, the digital divide, and put a spotlight on some new issues, use of AI uh, to help us combat the pandemic. My honor to uh, moderate this session over the next 45 minutes. Uh, and with me is a great panel. Uh, I start with Nicolas Brien, who's the CEO of France Digital, uh, Charles Edward Bouet, who's the CEO of Alpha Intelligence Capital, and we will be joined shortly, I hope, by Terry Dussault, who's the deputy CEO of Group Industrial Marcel Dussault. But let me start off by trying to set the stage a little bit, and I'd like to ask uh, first Nicolas and then Charles Edouard about what's your view on the latest segment of this digital revolution, and by that I mean just and of the last five years, and what COVID over the last few months has done to affect it, and, and what you think the vision will be for the next five years to 2025. Nicolas. Well, that's a very ambitious question. Um, I would start asking it with this. Every second over the past five years, 400 people in the world went online for the very first time. That's 600,000 people a day. And for the very first time in the last five years, the majority of the global population has access to the internet. So we're talking about a revolution that is becoming mainstream for the very first time in history. We are very far from the, the mythology of you know the, the startup guy or the engineer uh, in his basement, uh, producing some obscure code lines. This has become a mainstream revolution. Um, if I may, uh, the digital revolution is now televised. Um, the corona crisis is not about to change that. It's going to accelerate that. Because if we look at what's going on, we're having lockdowns all around the world. Uh, we are having... Um, what we call uh, social distancing, uh, which is in fact physical distancing. And we are moving all our social interactions into the digital sphere. And let, let me just give a few examples, um, a few examples um, looking at the French situation. In two weeks, uh, we had the number of remote workers multiplied by 10. In two weeks, we had the number of cyber attacks multiplied by four. In two weeks, we had the number of e-commerce purchases doubled. So it's, it's a digital revolution and it's accelerating. I would call that the, the great digital leap forward. And we are, we are witnessing it globally. Um, and let me be clear. This is just a great rehearsal of what's coming next. I'm not talking about the second wave or the third wave. I'm talking about um, climate change. Everyone seems to forget that Australia was facing lockdown over the past winter, and this had nothing to do with the corona crisis. This has something to do with wild forest fires. Every, everyone seems to forget that on the East Coast, uh, sometimes they are under lockdown because of hurricanes or because of snowstorms. I do believe that because of the intensifying uh, effects of climate change, during the 21st century, what we have witnessed with lockdowns all around the planet uh, with the corona crisis, we are going to face more and more phases of lockdown uh, and therefore more and more uh, incentives to move our, um, our, our social interactions into the digital sphere. And I may conclude on that point, um, tomorrow's world will be walking on two legs. 
digital transformation and the environmental transition. We won't get very far if we're not walking on these two legs. Thank you very much. That was uh, an excellent opening and I think uh, opens the door. Uh, let me move to Charles Edouard. Charles, uh, you play. Uh, what's your vision going forward? Um, yes, thank you for, thank you, uh, Andrew, for asking me. Thank you, Nicola, for the introduction. Uh, I think we're all talking about this tech digital revolution. Uh, when we step back, uh, this has been generated by the cash abundance, by the uh, cheap money that has been irrigating our economy since 2009. And basically, I believe that we are in this cash abundance era that has created the ability for nothing is impossible. And in technology, we've seen the first uh, unicorn. I mean, the, the world started in 2009. I think that I was discussing with Nicola before, 95% of the unicorns were born after 2015. So we've seen this time where everything was possible and this abundance of technology in depth, breadth and depth, has created all the titans that we see today. That's the purpose of and the topic of my latest book. But uh, most importantly, I think that uh, every one of us have been overwhelmed by this technology, a lot of fears in the average population, and we've seen a lot of uh, um, geopolitical titans raising. So you were asking, okay, what is it looking forward? So one first topic is, what about the COVID? COVID-19 is a revelation. It reveals the world we are really living in. I think, as you said, people are now using these technologies. We've seen the, the, the divide between people who have and people who don't have. Inequalities, people who have access, people who can decide. And if I'm looking forward... Um, it's going to accelerate and amplify because we've been putting more money on the table. We've been reducing the interest rate. I mean, interest rates are negative. If you want, we want to discuss it about what's the impact on tech, it has a huge impact. One billion dollar in 1,000 years is worth more than one billion dollar today. So any tech that can provide you with one billion dollars in 1,000 years is worth more than one billion dollar today. So we're going to see more titans technological and geopolitical. We've seen the uh, U.S. election last week. We're going to see more populism. We're going to see more tech, more startup. The TikTok of this world is going to be popping up everywhere. And as we know, we never stopped any technology. How lethal they were for humans. We didn't stop bioweapons. They're still around. We didn't stop nuclear. They're still around. So we're not going to stop technology. So what we have to work together is on making technology better for humans. And not opposing technology and humans, but making humans and technology work together. Thank you very much, Charles. And I think we'll come back to some, some of these uh, issues. Let me end with uh, Terry Dessart. Terry, uh, we were yeah. just talking about the last five years and the coming five years. What's, what's your uh, vision and what do you think have been some of the important milestones? Well, it's a good question, but uh, I will uh, answer what will uh, arrive in uh, six months uh, or one year is sufficient. And know what happened uh, for the, the COVID. It will be the hand. Uh, we heard uh, yesterday about uh, a vaccine that you have to prove, uh, prove of concept and uh, work very well. Uh, about the technology and the consideration with the, the internet. It's interesting because for the work at home, it was a little uh, use. And after the, the first crisis of, uh, of COVID, uh, everyone uh, uh, liked to, to work in house for time, but not for months because the people have to exchange at the office and to to be out of the of the <laughs> of the home not with the wife or the child but uh, uh, to change the air so for me uh, i can answer typically wait and see because it changed so fast and we can we can know what arrives in the, in one year Thank you. 
Oh, I want to move to the to have a discussion because I've got three incredibly uh, experienced but uh, differently positioned uh, panelists here, and uh, I, I'd love to hear hear your views on uh, what are the kind of the, and I come from the policy world, uh, not only the policy world of uh, governmental uh, agencies, but but also the interaction with other stakeholders, particularly the uh, business se sector and decision makers such as yourself. And so I'm, I'm, I'm curious if you can help me think through what some of the top two things decision makers uh, need to, to do to realize the visions uh, that you have just uh, articulated. And, and what do you see as some of the key barriers and kind of major threats coming forward in the near future? Uh, you've all touched on them a little bit in your opening uh, remarks, but I, I, I'd love to hear a little bit more. And if I could start with uh, Nicolas again, and then move to Charles Edouard, and end with Harry, but just two or three minutes, gentlemen, please. Well, I'm the least experienced uh, manager and policymaker on this panel, uh, so I'll try to, to stay humble. Um, what, what fascinates me is that most of our managers and policymakers are trained to face uh, economic cycles and financial cycles. We, and I say we because that's not a question of generation, we are not trained to face climate cycles and innovation cycles. Um, if I may translate into OECD world, my friend, uh, we are trained uh, to face uh, Jugla cycles more than Kondratiev or Schumpeter cycles. Um, and, and to me, that's that's the main issue, and, and we, we we got a sense of that uh, during the Corona crisis. Um, we are not properly trained to make future-proof uh, decisions. By future proof decisions, I mean decisions that may resist the next wave of social unrest, decisions that may resist the next wave of climate change, decisions that may resist the next innovation cycle. Um, and, and that's, that's a, a big challenge. Uh, what, what we have to do, uh, is just change totally the way we train our political and, and economic elites. Um, and that's why I was mentioning the, the world of tomorrow walking on two legs, uh, digital transformation and the environmental transition. I do believe that the same thing. We're talking about making future-proof decisions. Um, and to be quite clear, um, we should find ways so that our managers and policymakers uh, are not getting their performance assessed uh, on financial uh, instruments over financial ratios, but rather over their ability to make future-proof decisions. I, I think that's one of the main lessons of the corona crisis. Our leaders were not always able and capable of making future-proof decisions. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, I, I certainly agree and in the focus a lot of our work that we're in the midst of a Transition. I think it's been going on for some time, but we've certainly seen a uh, uptick uh, with COVID and really since uh, the advent of the smartphone and I think uh, widespread broadband um, availability. And uh, a lot of our legacy systems, whether they're training or institutions, are not well suited uh, for going forward. And so I'd uh, Love to pick up on this more, but before I do, let me uh, turn to Charles Edouard and then Terry to kind of get their their views on on how how we begin to navigate uh, going forward. I think there are two things we have to to keep in mind. Uh, one thing is serendipity. Humans need still to meet. I think you've all seen the study from J.P. Morgan that says that uh, they lost a lot of innovation. Uh, with this uh, remote work. The second thing is we need to make sure we reconcile humans and technology, otherwise we will have huge social unrest, even though people are enjoying their life in the virtual world. And uh, as I stated in the book, I believe we are in uh, capitalism without gravity. We have removed two things that are very important to capitalism. 
We have removed the uh, gravity of the interest rate. The money of tomorrow is worth more than the money of today. And we have removed facts, truth. So I believe that we are at full speed. And I think government need to understand that uh, they have unleashed a machine which is going at full speed, that we cannot save the world by having people working remotely, and that we need to uh, reconcile people and technology in the coming weeks and months. Thank you. Thank you. I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, governments unleashing this because many people would think that it was really coming from uh, private sector and it's a little bit about the governments uh, getting back upstream to have more of a role in shaping uh, the technology as it comes out into the marketplace. But before I, I, I let you respond to that, um, let me move to, to, to Terry Desor. Uh, and get, get his, his views on kind of what are some of the key factors we need to begin to consider policy-wise, whether in the C-suite or in government offices, to uh, take this in a direction that, that would be beneficial uh, for the economy and society. So what do you think are some of the um, key policies, whether by business people or by government people that we need to undertake to get a better handle on the digital transformation and shape it in a, a beneficial way. Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Sure. Uh, it's just that we, we, we're, we're talking about how to go, go, go forward. And I'm, I'm keen to have a, an outcome that is beneficial for, for all. And so the, the, the question is, what should policymakers do, and, and what are some of the threats? What are some of the barriers uh, for us reaching the socially optimal goal that we we all would like to see? So, if I understand, what is the best for the uh, population with the technology? Yes, please. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, well, I I think that. Uh, and you mentioned uh, for the preparation uh, what the, the Europe can can do uh, to be uh, near the well, U.S. or other big big country. Oh, I think yeah. that uh, everybody is, is different. Say you are, you are going to use this type of application, and you will not have other one. Uh, as you see, for the last years, uh, some uh, application uh, access provider are not more in use. I think about uh, Yahoo, for example. Uh, my my uh, my work is to think what can work in few in few years, but it doesn't does, it doesn't work each time. Because we can make error, uh, it depends also for the inter international uh, conflict eventually. And uh, as you see, for the American election, it's very interesting because uh, I think for a lot of people, it was hard to to get uh, Mr. Trump for president of the United States, and uh, we are. Uh, we are glad, finally, to, to get Mr. Biden, and we'll see what can happen. For, for the technology, um, as I, I am a little geek for a long time, uh, I was interested by the hybrid car, so I get one or two, three years ago. But I, I see in Canada, the, the range is only 50 kilometers, so it's not very useful. Just order a car, uh, one hundred percent electric. It will be a little Volvo and uh, I think it's not possible. Well, you you put the heat in the winter or the or the air conditioner in the in the summer. I think that we can do only 300 kilometers. This is a point of view. 
But after you have to, to uh, think where you can refuel in energy. And in France, I don't know in other country, maybe in uh, United States is a little better, but you have not uh, many, many uh, stations to put your electric uh, in full. So my yeah. trend is very simple. And it was the trend of my uh, grandfather, Marcel Dassault. Don't trust the engineer. Why? Because I can do the very good thing, maybe a little uh, expensive, but if the client will buy the product, mm. it's the more important. And the client is the king. Well, I think, thank, thank you. I think that's um, important. Um, and, and, and we're beginning to uh, uh, raise this, this point. And so I want to turn it towards kind of the technology of what is quickly uh, on our doorsteps, which is artificial intelligence. And um, here, as you were alluding to, it appears by lots of measures that I look at, whether it be R&D or venture capital or scientific health publications, that this field is disproportionately led by two large countries, the United States and uh, China. And I'm, I'm, I, I'm curious if you all think if this observation is correct, and and if Europe is lagging behind, why do you think this is the uh, case? Is there a niche for, for Europe, and, and what can Europe do to, to catch up? Do you think that's uh, critical that we do so? Let me start with uh, uh, Nicholas. Uh, Charles Edouard is, is a great expert. He, he should start. Okay, thank you, Nicola. Uh, then I can start. Okay. First, artificial intelligence is an oxymoron because there's no such thing as artificial intelligence, okay? So I prefer to talk about algorithmic science, which is more uh, the real world. Yes, we are lagging behind. The US and China have been investing massive amount of money. They have a huge customer base, and they are on that race, like the space race in the past, uh, for now many years. But in Europe, we have a chance. We have GDPR. And GDPR is b becoming a global norm. And if you think about artificial intelligence or algorithmic science, it's all about the data. And it's all about the use of your own data. So as I said before, and I wrote it in another book called The Fall of the Human Empire, the challenge we have is to create human augmented intelligence, blending the humans with the intelligence, with the algorithmic science. And, and to, uh, to, to quote um, someone I met many years ago, Today, you all, we all have in our pockets the remote control of our life. This is our phone, with which we are doing many things. But don't forget, this is the remote control of your life. It's remote. Someone else is controlling. So if Europe wants to lead the same way we won the battle of uh, the mobile phone with GSM norms, we have to use fully GDPR, and we have to move from the remote control of your life to the control of your life with your own data. Thank you, Charles Edouard. I, I, I appreciate Nicholas uh, going to you first. I, I couldn't agree more that it's, first of all, really machine learning uh, uh, is a better definition than, than AI at this point, which is incredibly dependent on the data going into it. And it's the, the I think the data we need to pay a lot of attention to. Uh, Nicholas? Well, I, I don't write do as many that? books as Charles Edouard, so that, that's why I, I decided to make him lead the conversation. But um, he, he made some very relevant points, and uh, I'll try to complement uh, what, what he said. Um, basically, when it comes to AI, Europe invests too little and trains too little. Uh, if, if you look at who are the top guys in AI labs all around the world, they are Europeans or they were trained in European AI labs. 
Um, but they're now working for U.S. companies, uh, or Chinese companies sometimes, or Israeli companies. Uh, and this is quite uh, sad. Uh, when I look at the, the, the Shanghai ranking, for instance, and I see the, the top global university in mathematics, it's a French one, it's Paris-Saclay. But, I mean, we train the best, clearly. We, we do train the best in Europe, but we train too little. We train only a, a few dozens a year of excellent, renowned, world-class data scientists. But look at Stanford. They train thousands while we train thousands. So th there is obviously a question of uh, academia here. We need to train more. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's really vital. Uh, I understand the, the regulatory point of it, but we definitely, we need to invest massively in education, in our university, in our research world. This is absolutely fundamental. The, my second point is that we invest too little. Um, and, and I'm very uh, keen on hearing uh, Thierry's uh, po point of view on, on that point. Uh, that was um, when, when Charles Edouard uh, was uh, leading Roland Berger. Th th there was a very, very uh, interesting study that came out showing that uh, large U.S. corporations invest six times more in AI startups than their European counterparts. This is huge. This is a massive gap. We need more investment. And by investment, I don't mean any, time, any type of investment. I mean M&A. I, I mean build up. I mean that uh, large European corporations, and I mean European, not only French corporations, they need to acquire AI startups and need, they need to pay the price for it. Because that's where the technology is, that's where the, 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 the user centric um, AI is, and that's where the value is. The, and clearly, we are totally lagging behind. Uh, the, 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 the US, the large US corporations have this culture of building up. They have this culture of purchasing, uh, interesting AI startups. We don't. Um, and sometimes, uh, Thierry just said that, uh, uh, technology is, uh, the topic that is too important to, to, to leave it to engineers. I do believe that the right person to educate uh, in large European corporations is not necessarily the CTO, it's the CFO. Thank you very much. So, Terry, this is a question directly yeah. to you. Please. Um, uh, so, what what so should I say? Well, the <laughs> question that, that, that Nicolas has, has posed is um, the need for large firms in Europe, including France, to um, enter more into the latest technology, such as uh, machine learning or AI, by acquiring uh, innovative startups. Um, what do you think about that? And um, why do you think maybe it's not happening? And what can we do to, to improve it? Okay. Um, for AI, yeah, um, what I think is that for medicine and for um, comparison of, uh, uh, I don't know in English, radi radiology, for the radio, you can compare a uh, thousand, thousand of cliché and you will uh, see rapidly what is not good for the patient. Um, I have a good story for uh, AI. Yeah, it's uh, it's a car who is uh, total totalment uh, automatic, and uh, she detects a stop, so she stops. But uh, the stop go forward about three four ma four, <laughs> four meters, so the the car uh, go back, go. Finally, the the signal of stop was on a man who walk. So it's very difficult to, to uh, preview this type of uh, incident because uh, maybe on the, on the road uh, another car came from the right or the left. Uh, the AI is uh, aggregation of the experience of many things. I don't, I don't think personally that it can work everywhere. And uh, I have another image, and uh, everyone, 
Everybody uh, remembers the film Terminator, and uh, in Terminator, the robot takes the power, and that's not a, not a good life. <laughs> I, I will. Uh, I want to to come back uh, on the Star Trek, on the possibility uh, between uh, well, more France than Europe and the US, because I know most uh, in France uh, it's quite difficult to get some uh, some money. Uh, we can say that, unfortunately, the French are a little pessimistic, so they, they begin to, to, to say it's not possible, it will not work. I say we can try and we see. We all know that if we invest in 10 projects, maybe one or two will be successful and no more. So it's an habit to have. But I think we have to, to, to make the, the investment and to try not too long, but one, two years and see if the market is good. Uh, Thank you. For me and to, uh, also in advance. And uh, you will think about the virtual uh, pocket uh, money on the smart card. A long time ago, long time, and finally uh, it's it's come. So uh, sometimes we are too much in advance, and we have to to keep the the ground and not to say it's finished and it will not work. Thank you. I I, I think that's um, particularly given. The heritage of your firm, uh, very prescient insight that sometimes you're just ahead of the game, and uh, it takes some time to um, catch catch up. I'm 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 also um, uh, aware that uh, it does seem this is my my next question is about how to begin to build a more supportive ecosystem both in France and in Europe for those type of good new ideas uh, so that, as you were saying, it's really about the consumers uh, being willing to adopt and to pull on um, some of these te technologies, but it's also, as the other two panels have said, about getting the right type of investment, not only financial investment, risk capital, but uh, human uh, in in investment uh, as Nicola has, 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 has said, and, and I'm, I'm, as someone who sits at the OECD between three different continents, in Europe, North America, and, and Asia, uh, I'm eager to see all three uh, advance to the frontier and compete, because it's at that point that we begin to see productivity gains and great innovation. Um, and so with with that, there's, there's been a, an emerging conversation here in Europe um, about what's called technology sovereignty. Now, I'd like to ask each of you your, your view on this concept, uh, which is really talking about putting a bit of a ring fence geographically uh, around an, an area so that you can nurture your own uh, te technology. Um, and I don't know who wants to start here, but I'd uh, love to see, see a volunteer. Maybe I'll pick on uh, Charles Edward. Charles, do you have a view on technology sovereignty? Yeah, I guess started and then um, Nicola will add because he's leading a very large group of uh, startups in, uh, in Europe, the largest, I think, 14,000. Um, I mean, I'm always optimistic. So having said this, uh, Europe has a chance. I mean, we are, I mean, let's make no mistake. It's ring fenced in the US. It's ring fenced in China. So there's nothing bad about ring fencing to some extent. You know, that's the first thing. The second thing is we are the, the country, the continent of Renaissance. We are the country and the continent of humanism. We have the philosophers. So, it's very natural when technology has to meet the humans, I mean, this human augmented intelligence, 
that it should happen in Europe. And that's why we have GDPR. So building on my previous point, we need to build this portable AI, uh, this Jiminy Cricket of Pinocchio 1948, or this Joy of Blade Runner 2048. Thierry, you mentioned sci-fi. This algorithmic uh, entity that helps you live your life better. And I think this is the direction I've been pushing, you know, in my previous firm, in my current firm, uh, in uh, Think Tank. We need to build the Jiminy Cricket or the Joy of Tomorrow as being a European Renaissance Erasmus humanist uh, idea. Nicolas? You made a very interesting point. Um, we, we may have some American friends uh, watching this debate, and some of them might think that Every time we talk about uh, European tech sovereignty, we are talking about uh, basically having a transatlantic tech divide. I, I don't think we should we should see it that way. I, I think we should actually just uh, think about what has been working well to create innovation ecosystems around the world, and when you look at it, you look at Israel, you look at South Korea, you look at China, you look at the US, obviously, the Silicon Valley, um, all of them uh, implemented uh, tech policies that were quite uh, sovereign-oriented. Um, just, I'll give one example. In the European Union, we are the only continent in the world where there is no um, public procurement specifically oriented to startups. Uh, I, I've been um, releasing an op-ed uh, last month, uh, which, which is a call for BETA, uh, B-E-T-A, by European Technology Act. I do believe that we need a by European Technology Act in order to plug some of the, the gigantic amounts of public spending into the treasure chest of our startups. Uh, it, it's, uh, I mean, we, we, we can have all these startups fundraising, you know, all of the time and raising much VC money all around the world. If they don't have revenues and, and revenues from the public contracts, I, I don't think we would be kickstarting kick anything. Um, it's, it's the only eco innovation ecosystem in the world where public procurement is not oriented towards startups. Uh, and, and I do think that we need to fix this. I will just come to, to, to a conclusion. Um, sometimes when we are talking about European innovation ecosystems, you hear this very pessimistic view of, well, you know, it's, it's over. Ch China and the US have won. I don't think so. Uh, I, th I think we have a, a specific way of uh, making tech products and services in Europe because I mean, look at the world. Uh, our societies are different. Our cultures are different. And our startups are just the mirror of this. Uh, they are just the mirror of this, and they will be addressing issues that Americans and Chinese just don't care about. I'll give two very specific examples. Car sharing. The world leader of car sharing is French. It's blah, blah, car. Huh? The idea would never come to an American mind. Who in the U.S. is going to share his car? Uh, no one. Uh, I'm going to give another example. Uh, the, the world leader for refurbishing is back market. That's another French leader. Who in the U.S. is going to refurbish his or her smartphone instead of buying a new one? No one. No one will have this idea coming to, to his or her mind. So... Because we are Europeans, because we want to address specific issues that are dear to, to our hearts and to our history, um, we will produce some tech giants, we will produce tech leaders that are very different from the tech leaders and the tech giants that the Chinese and the Americans are producing. And I think that's probably uh, for the better world. Could not agree more. I look forward to it. Terry. Uh, would you like to address this question about technology sovereignty and um, maybe, as Nicolas has just said, the 
by European Technology Act about the kind of looking more at home before you look globally. Uh, Harry? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nick, I have the pleasure to, to discuss with uh, two years ago. Uh, and uh, I asked to him, when you come, and he said it's different in U.S. or Canada because the distance are very long and uh, it's more complicated to to take some somebody for a long trip. So some some success can be more maybe in U.S. or more in in, in Europe. For the for the yeah, so we we talk a lot. Uh, what can we say we can say that uh, before you are bought, uh, we can do, uh, especially in uh, aviation or, or for perspective. And uh, it's very uh, interesting that the worker can do something else and can take a, a step more and earn more money. The, the uh, shame that uh, we are not the best because we can be the best, and I think uh, well, I was born in the uh, aviation area, but uh, the first plane I think was, was uh, built in France or, or in or Europe, and it was a, a mess, messy invention. And we can find surely other maybe the the film or so for the movies. So I think uh, finally. Nothing is closed. Everything can move. And we are here to move the thing. And not to say, oh, there's something, we can do nothing. Uh, it's not possible. Um, for the actuality of COVID, uh, you, you know, uh, you heard about the firm uh, Moderna. Moderna was founded by a French. <laughs> but the French uh, was uh, working in France. And finally, he was so in advance and won so lot of money, 100 million, that he go in in US. So we lost him. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we just have a few minutes left, and um, I, I I want to take some questions from our our audience. And one that has come in that takes us back to almost where our opening was, we were talking about um, the climate change, uh, but also uh, the recent U.S. election. So the, the, the question is, how can we implement a digital revolution that respects Paris the climate agreement? And I think Charles Edouard was, was the first to begin to uh, touch on this, the intersection between the two. And I... I, I'd ask him to uh, lead off, but uh, acknowledge we don't have much time before the end of the session. Um, interesting question. Um, the paradox is that uh, technology and new technology are using more and more electricity. I think I don't have the latest number, but something like 10% of the world energy is consumed for our little machine and uh, and uh, cooling off uh, all the data centers that we have. So we have to find a better way to use uh, energy from the new technologies. Um, and, and you're right. I mean, the, the, the challenge that we have is in this world of cash abundance, in this world of acceleration of time, in this world where we have this uh, technological titan, this geopolitical titan, we should not miss the most important points. Humans on this planet need to be reconciled with technology, and humans in this planet need to live in a better environment. And by the way, for the little story, in the end of the fall of the human empire, my previous book, you know, uh, you discover that machines have an interest, even more than us, to live in a better environment. They don't like acid, they don't like flooding, they don't like problem with energy. So maybe this is where we can reconcile ourselves with machines. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Nicolas. Well, well um, what's your take on, on, on the intersection? Thierry, Thierry has very good references and wanted to quote sci-fi, so I'm going to quote a very important American philosopher. 
Peter Parker, uh, who said, uh, with great power comes great responsibilities. Um, and I do believe that's what the tech industry is facing at the moment. We are not uh, small startups in the garage anymore. We have produced giants. Uh, their market capitalization is now exceeding the one of uh, large banks uh, and big oil. So now it's time to, to think not only about the engineer, what, what engineers care about, and, and I do uh, agree with, with Thierry, um, I think that we should um, totally assess the impact of big tech on environment. And you're talking about uh, the transatlantic relationship. We just had a, a new uh, president-elect uh, in the U.S. I do believe that the Europeans need to work closely with the Americans in order to bring this specific issue of uh, the, environment Im the environmental impact of big tech into the Paris Agreement. That's something that is not mentioned. The Paris Agreement is uh, 2015. Now, uh, at uh, COP26 uh, in Glasgow in 2021, we need to put the environmental impact of tech industries into this agreement and we need to tackle this issue. That's a very, that's an emergency. That's a great issue because big tech are growing stronger and stronger and we need to uh, address their environmental impact. That's very important. I I'm a bit more optimistic than Charlotte Edouard. Let's uh, look at the data. Um, in Internet traffic basically uh, multiplied by 12 since 2000. The overall consumption of data center stayed at 1% of global electricity consumption. So we probably have ways to produce uh, digital services that are, uh, I would say, uh, saving energy and, and consuming less. Thank you, thank you very much. We're, we're near to the final end of the uh, session, but I'd like to give the last word to uh, Terry, but Terry, I'm afraid uh, you're going to have to be very succinct. Um, we don't have much time. Please. Okay, goodbye. No, I present. <laughs> um, no, what I can repeat is that the, the client is the king and the we have to produce what uh, what you want to to get, and uh, certainly an, um, a light uh, application and not uh, complicated the connection. And uh, when you you go on the on the website, and uh, it's, if it don't function, about I don't know, but maybe ten or twenty seven. Now you you go out and you you don't uh, come back. So we we have to to trade the the pollution. It's certain, and uh, when we see the Arctic and Antarctic, uh, all the mess with uh, with the ice, and uh, for the the fawn and the, the animals, it's uh, now time to to get something else and to to change our life. I think that's a great way to end. Thank thank you so much. Let me thank all three of the panelists. It's been uh, very interesting insights into the digital revolution and where we're going. Um, let me turn it back over to, to the organizers, but thank, thank you all for your contributions.